All right. Well, uh, Sam, it's so great to have you on today's uh, leadership podcast. We're so glad that you're here. We're really uh, kind of branching out uh, into our diversity practice. So we're being uh, very intentional about talking about diversity when it comes to building teams and some of the challenges and obstacles people might face. So today, uh, you and I are going to have a conversation about just some obstacles and barriers and, and uh, yeah. see how we can help, uh, you know, Christian organizations that are, they've been talking about it, thinking about diversifying their teams, and they're just not sure what to do. And we want to help them kind of identify some obstacles and then how to overcome them. So I'm so glad you joined, uh, joined me on the podcast today. Well, I'm excited as well. I think we are in a critical moment. And so many organizations and leaders are trying to figure it out. You know, a lot of the conversations I've been having have been people pulling me to the side and, you know, uh, being more honest about where they are and asking, you know, hey, what about this? And, you know, just kind of a safe place to say some things they may not be able to say publicly and get some traction on some things and some understanding. So I, I am encouraged more than I've ever been that um, people are trying to figure this out. Mm-hmm. And and tell me, why do you think the conversation is important? Like, just why should we be having the yeah. conversation? Yeah, well, I think, you know, Gen Z is the most diverse generation in our lifetime. And uh, the ones that are coming up now, and even the ones under Gen Z, um, that it, within their class, there is no majority anymore. So we're mm-hmm. talking about Uh, the emerging adult class that'll be coming up, the future leaders of tomorrow, is a diverse generation. So we have to get this right for the, one, obviously there's a Jesus ethic attached to it, but then also because the general, our kids that are growing up and that will be living in this world, will be living in a world that is diverse. And whether we like it or not, whether they like it or not, they're gonna have to figure out how to play with everybody. So um, we gotta get this right for the sake of the next generation. Yeah, yeah, I I agree. I, I personally, I have a uh, I have a son who is a um, a millennial, but then I've got a a grandson, right? That I don't know what he'll be. <laughs> he, I don't right. know if they've labeled him yet. He's just a year old. But as a, a mom raising an African American son in in the city of Houston, right? And then now my son who will raise an African-American son, there's always um, some concern about yeah. the racial climate in our country. Uh, and um, how does that affect their relationship when it comes to the church? So um, you're absolutely correct. It's important to uh, start having that conversation because of the next generation, but could you dive a little deeper into what does that mean when it comes to the faith, to Christian organizations? Yeah. Like, why is it important for them to have that conversation? Yeah, well, I think, and we talked about this earlier on the kind of promo video, right, of us announcing this newfound partnership that we have, which I'm excited about. And we said, you know, that Martin Luther King Jr. always said that some. Sunday morning was the most segregated hour in America. And unfortunately, that's still perhaps true today, that we still have churches. Now we've evolved in terms of our laws. We've, been, we've evolved in terms of, you know, interracial marriage and other things. But unfortunately, you know, the, the, the church itself still tends to be very segregated on Sunday, whether we call it our preferences versus well, this is just who, kind of the community I grew up in, whatever it is, there are churches and organizations that exist in diverse communities that do not reflect the diverse community that they live in. Mm-hmm. And that in itself is a problem. And not just in the audience, but there are even some churches that I've seen that perhaps have a diversity coming in, but the leadership doesn't reflect uh, the congregation. And so I think as long as those two problems are present, uh, uh, we're missing some things. And I, I think, you know, if the local church is to be the hope of the community, then we have to be creating churches and we have to have churches and staffs that reflect that community so that the glory of God 
can be realized and can be seen and spread in a way like never before. Also, I think our salvation depends on it. I think it impacts the mission of the church. If, if it is to save all, right, um, then I always imagine trying to get someone saved that doesn't speak the same language that I speak so they can't understand what I'm saying. And so it's the same thing with, the, with diversity. You know, we have cultures that honestly speak a different language. Maybe it's the same English language, but in terms of cultural yeah. barriers, you know, we speak a different language. We, we lose each other in the felt needs. And so I think it's so important because it's, it's, it's missional critical. Yeah, I love that. Yeah, that, that perspective is so true and so on point, right? We, we miss each other culturally. And uh, sometimes if we do that, we're not able to meet the needs of our community. Yeah. So if you're looking, uh, let's say if you are creating a roadmap to diversity, what are some of the top three or four obstacles you think an organization would encounter when moving uh, toward diversity, right? I, I do believe that many Christian organizations today, churches, are sitting at their boardroom table, if you will, and they're starting to have the conversation about what do we need to do. Talk about some obstacles that they will probably encounter as they move toward diversity. Yeah, I think, I think there's some of the obstacles that we've even encountered when launching this practice. And I think the biggest one is um, there are people that just flat out don't believe that it's a problem. And unfortunately, I've seen that in so many organizations around our country today, that the leader gets excited about it. And he's trying to move it down the field, but it gets stopped by somebody that's in a critical position that just doesn't believe it's important. And so they gridlock it, they stop it, and they don't move forward. And, um, and I've had to do a lot of work with organizations just helping the leader understand that his greatest threat to progress with diversity in his organization is his exec pastor, <laughs> is his chief ministry officer, is his chief financial officer. The ones that are closest to him are the ones actually stopping it because their heart or their mind hasn't changed. Okay. And so um, I think that's, that's, that's probably one of the biggest ones, um, just getting people that are in critical positions around it um, and honestly, I've seen it take double, if not triple the time that it could take because of the individuals that are underneath uh, the leader. Or it could be the opposite. There's an exec mm -hmm. pastor that's really passionate, but the pastor it, isn't. It's like, ah, I get it, but that's not important. And so I, I really do think it's about getting all hearts on the same page, all hearts and minds on the same page. I think another big key, and I'll leave it at this, is... Um, or another big challenge is the backlash that you get from the public, right? Mm -hmm. There are just individuals in your congregation that say, eh, right? Or in your, your customer base that say, huh, why are we even focusing on this? You know, politically it means this and we're getting political and we're just like, no, 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 no. Like we're just, we're trying to come together. And honestly, that is because we've all grown up in different environments with different understandings of history um, and make decisions based out of what we grew up in. Um, and unfortunately, a lot of those perspectives can be short-sighted. Um, and so I, like, I just, we just did an interview here. I'm at the Orange offices here uh, in Atlanta, Georgia, um, Orange Curriculum, Orange Conference, Orange Tour. And we just talked about the idea of our immediate surroundings dictating what we think and how we grew up. And we said that it was okay to evolve giving mm -hmm. people permission to evolve, that you don't have to stay the way that you are, whether you're black, white, Asian, Hispanic, you can evolve and it, you have permission <laughs> to evolve. And so I think that, you know, I think people have to be open to that. Yeah, yeah. And, you know, as believers, so yeah, okay, so maybe the executive leadership team, their obstacles, maybe it's your, your uh, base, you know, your congregation, your membership, your constituents that are, that could possibly be um, obstacles. Yeah. But the truth is 
that as the body of Christ, our drive should be towards unity. And unity doesn't happen in a silo. Yeah. Uh, it doesn't happen just with your quote unquote customer base, right? Unity is about the entire body of Christ, every color, creed, background, tongue coming together, all in the glory uh, of Jesus Christ to yeah. uplift his name and to advance his kingdom. And, and I know, uh, I believe that that is our heart, you and I, as we move into this diversity practice and overcoming obstacles. Uh, it's interesting, I, I received this scripture from um, one of my colleagues this week, and it's a scripture that I love so much, and I think it's applicable, applicable to what we're doing, and that is that the world will know that we are Christ's disciples by how we love the brethren. Not yeah. how we love the people that look like us, think like us, but how we love the brethren. And sometimes mm. that means loving those that don't look like you. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. I 100% so, agree. Yeah, so give me some practical and maybe proven steps that an organization can take to overcome these obstacles? Yeah, I mean, I think the first step they can take is hiring us, mm -hmm. <laughs> right? <Yes. laughs> the first thing is, you know, getting with some experts or people that have at least had some experience in it that can really help walk you through, here's how you navigate it because every situation is different. I always tell people, I can give you a principle but if I don't come out and sit with you, if, we, if Chantel doesn't come out and sit with you, if you don't sit with somebody and talk through your unique situation, mm -hmm. then you may have a principle, but you may not know how to apply it. And so you need someone to sit down with you and really help walk you through it. It's one of the reasons why we value this so much. Um, I'll say this, I've never seen an organization move forward because they just read a book. Mm -hmm. The book matters, it helps. What, what really helps is when a pastor sits down one-on-one -on -one with somebody and they're able to wrestle through some concepts because it's often deeper than we think it is. And every situation is unique. And so you really need somebody to come out or, or have even a friend in your life. Maybe you don't hire us, I think you should, um, but maybe you hire somebody else or maybe you just call a friend and y'all sit down and have lunch and one-on-one -on -one get some practical application on, hey, what is the stalemate here? What is keeping mm -hmm. us back? You need an individual diagnosis around it. I think if I were to come up higher, that, that being my first step, my second step yeah. would be, um, you know, I'm at Orange again, and we talk a lot at Orange about strategy. Okay. Strategy. Um, if you don't have a strategy, then you can't guarantee a goal. It's very mm -hmm. difficult without a strategy. Um, a goal without a strategy is just a dream. Mm. But if you have a strategy, now you know how to one plus one equals two, so on and so forth, and you can duplicate that process throughout your organization. And so I would say that, what is your strategy for diversity? Some people may be listening and going, strategy? Why do we need a strategy, right? <laughs> like, it's like, diversity, need, is, is it really that? I'm like, yeah, yeah. Yes, the reason that your organization honestly probably keeps hitting the same brick wall that you hate that it hits to whoever the pastor is or the leader is listening is because you don't have a strategy, but you have to have a value for a strategy to even create the strategy. And so even when we come and sit with you, those are some of the things that we'll do is sit down with you and help you create your unique strategy. Okay, how do we get you here and what, and here's what I wanna say. Even if you don't have a strategy, I want to say you do have a strategy. Your strategy is that you don't have a strategy. Mm -hmm. And your lack of strategy is causing you to hit the goal that your lack of strategy is actually leading you towards. And so um, that's the other thing I would say is, you know, make sure you have a strategy. And the last thing I'll say, and there's 80 more that we could name, but you got to yeah. bring Chantel out, right? Uh, the, <laughs> the, the, the next one I'll say is you got to check your heart. Mm. you got to check your heart um and not only your heart here's the practical you have to check the hearts of the people around you mm -hmm. that's good so you have 
God has spoken to you about the need for this in your organization, in your family, in your life. But has that same heart translated to the people closest to you? I know we we joked about it earlier and we said that often, you know, the stalemate is our exec pastor or even our lead pastor, wh- wh- whoever it is that is in charge or helping to move this thing forward, you have to make sure that you are disseminating what God has done in your heart to the closest people around you that are helping you run that organization. Mm -hmm. For several reasons. One, because you can't get anything done alone. But two, as a leader, you know, a, a mentor of mine always told me the leader's job is to make sure that as he's leading, that the people are still behind him as he, ter- as he turns the corner. Because a lot of times what will happen is you'll turn a corner as a leader and you look behind you and your team is way back. You left them. Yeah. You left them. You get, went to another place. They're still stuck back in Florida. You, you've driven to Georgia and you're going, where, where is everybody? And so mm-hmm. I think as leaders, you have to pause long enough to go, hey, here's what God's doing in me. And let me talk to you about what he's done. And let me help you even understand so that maybe God does the same thing in you. And uh, so I, that's, that, those are a couple of things I would say. Yeah, yeah. And, and that's biblical, right? The, the Bible is clear to uh, write the vision, make yeah. it plain. That means you got to explain it, break it down, yeah. uh, give your heart behind it. Yeah. And then the people will run with it. So yeah, so you've got to put a, you got to put a plan together. It's biblical to uh, help walk this out and to help uh, change and shift your organization to be uh, more diverse. And diversity for us comes in many ways, right? It could be diverse in race. It could be diverse in um, gender. Not that we're trying to change anyone's theology as it relates to women in ministry, but maybe there's a a woman that should sit on your leadership uh, table, at your leadership table, who will help you to make decisions where that population of people, women, uh, they play a huge part in church, right? Yeah. Where yeah. that population of people is represented at the decision-making table to help uh, guide. Um, so what do you say to those organizations that are most, in- not they're not interested, right? They're not interested in bringing differences of opinion, yeah. differences of race, differences of gender and 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 again i want to say not gender in your theology just gender uh in decision making processes uh they're just not interested so uh they're fine with what's going on in their organization and how things are what would you say to that population of people yeah you know i would say if you had a high school pastor that did not spend time getting perspectives from high school students. You would say that that high school pastor was not smart in the way that he did things. Mm -hmm. You would often probably say that he, that that is an arrogant strategy that how can you serve people and you don't understand what's going on? How can you serve a population and you don't even have the population helping you think through the actual issues that are going on with that population. And I think we would say the same thing, even in corporate America. We would never look at Coca-Cola and say, well, you're trying to reach the Hispanic community with all white men Mm -hmm. or even with all white women. Like, no, no, like you don't have the Hispanic in the room and you, you're not, you don't know anything about the Hispanic. We would all, we would all say logically that that, that doesn't make sense. Mm -hmm. Right. But for some reason, when it comes to the church or even faith-based, value-based organizations and businesses, not all people, but some leaders, for some reason, when it comes to that, it's, well, we can do it without women. Mm -hmm. Well, we can do it without African-Americans. We can do it without Hispanic. We can serve them without having them at the table. Mm -hmm. And you would not advise anyone to do that and you would say to corporate America, that's stupid, <laughs> right? I mean, mm-hmm. you know, uh, and I'm not calling anybody stupid out there. I'm just, I'm, I'm saying what we would say to another organization. And so obviously it's more complicated than I'm making it. 
But I would say the same thing to those individuals that say, oh, why do we need it? I would say, you know, it, it is a misstep to try to lead some people um, and, and, and you don't have a representative from them in the room. Mm -hmm. um, and I would say your, your leadership is limited. And I would venture to say, if I built an organization and, and didn't have a white man in the room and there are white men in the audience, it would be a problem. Mm -hmm. It would be, because then I don't understand white individuals or, or white men. And I'm trying to serve that population. I'll tell you this, and I'm done. Um, I've done a lot of ministry in uh, predominantly white spaces. Mm -hmm. And I've done a lot of ministry in black spaces as well and multicultural spaces. It actually went black first, then white, then multicultural. Mm -hmm. And one of the things I had to do in the white space because I grew up in an all black environment um, was I had to submit myself to white individuals to understand their issues, their plight, their problems in order to be effective in ministry when I was ministering to them. And I'll tell you this, and I'll just be really honest, there were moments that I would be preaching a message or trying to give or whatever, and it was weak to that specific demographic because they knew I knew nothing about them. <laughs> yeah. They, could, they just knew they could tell you like, he has no idea what college football is like, <laughs> right? He, he has no idea what shopping at Old Navy is like, right? He has no idea about my specific yeah. culture. He doesn't know about my music. Yeah. He doesn't know about the television yeah. shows. He doesn't know about my problems. He doesn't know anything. And, 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 and people can tell and they could tell. And so they would pull me to the side and even say, Sam, actually, we don't do that. Actually, and this is white people talking to me. Yes. And so I would say the same is true in reverse. Mm -hmm. to, but to think, and, and I would say to think, I, and I'll use me, to think that I was going to be successful in leading in that environment without knowing about that environment was a, was a, was a, was a grave mistake mm -hmm. that I made. Um, and when I, when I realized that and I changed, all of a sudden I, I started getting invited to more places. And mm -hmm. They started putting me on stage more. Like, and my ministry grew because I was hitting the felt need of that community. So I would say mm -hmm. this, if you're okay, and I'm just gonna speak predominantly to white organizations, and I'll speak predominantly to all organizations. If you're okay with just serving white people, do it. You don't need any minorities around the table. If you wanna reach all people, you need all people around the table. If you're okay with just serving black people, you don't need any white people around the table. But if you wanna serve all people, you need all people around the table. And the same is true for every culture. And, and I'll say this, you know, I'm, I'm real honest about it. I'm just going, hey, you don't have to be diverse. You don't want to be. Sure. Right? But, mm -hmm. but if you want to be, there's some steps that need to be taken. And I, I don't know about, I want to be. I, I, feel I like want to be. I want to be. And I feel that the Lord, you know, Paul talked about becoming all things to all men that we yep. might win some. Yep. So, that's what I'd say. You know, I, I'm not going to force anybody to do anything, but I would say, check your heart, check your theology, and figure out what your real goals are and see if what you're doing right now aligns. That's wonderful. And uh, thank you for that, because it's so true. And um, I think it's on the heart and the mind of the Lord. And that's why it's on the heart and the mind of so many people today. Um, he is wanting the body of Christ to come together as one bride, as we're supposed to. And, and, and uh, we can only do that when we're willing to take the step. And it's important. Sam, yeah. thank you for uh, coming on today and joining me and talking about, you know, this is a, a uncomfortable conversation sometimes yeah. because to start calling out, um, all white this or all black that, you know, sometimes isn't, <laughs> doesn't feel good. As they used to say in church, uh, well, if your toes just got stepped on, just say, ouch. <laughs> and then we can <laughs> move on, right? <laughs> so yeah, exactly. thank you. Thank you for coming on. Thank you for stepping on our toes and for identifying some obstacles and barriers that uh, organizations will encounter, but then giving some practical steps 
uh, to overcome those. And we're definitely, you and I would uh, love to come out and help out any organization that yeah. is looking to move uh, towards diversifying their teams. Thanks so much, Sam. 100%. Thank you.